archival journals, and refereed proceedings. Her research has been awarded several honors, including four Best Paper Awards, a National Science Foundation Career Award, and a Department of the Army Young Investigator Award. Dr. Albert is an INFORMS Vice President for Marketing, Communication, and Outreach, and she's the author of the blogs Punk Rock Operations Research and How I Found Her, Badger Bracketology. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in welcoming Laura Albert. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think I'm all mic'd up here. So um, thanks for inviting me, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here today and talk about uh, football analytics, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So most of my research is on in ranking college sports teams, football, men's basketball, and then forecasting the college football playoff. And uh, I grew up in, outside of Chicago, and I was a diehard Chicago, professional Chicago sports team fan. Was completely uninterested in uh, college sports growing up because why do you need college sports when you have the 85 Bears and Michael Jordan um, gave me everything I needed and uh, but things changed and I got very interested in sports analytics and Wisconsin has been a really great place to study that. Uh, I am an engineer and so I want to give a quick overview about what I really do. Uh, I am an industrial and systems engineering and as Scott mentioned my specialty is operations research and I like to say we improve systems. And a system is a set of things, which could be people, cells, vehicles, sometimes even basketball or football teams, um, that produce their own behavior uh, over time because they are, they're interconnected. So I'd like to say a single car is just a vehicle, but a collection of cars could be a traffic jam. Right? So sometimes those interconnections matter. And I think that will come out today when I talk about ranking sports teams. And I have a picture of a slinky here to represent these interconnections. If you move one part of the slinky, everything else moves. And a lot of times I actually am designing systems of Homeland Security and Emergency Response uh, that are interconnected, and those interconnections are important. Uh, now, our world is really increasingly connected, and systems really do matter, right? And I can talk about a lot of applications, and of course, as some of you have noted, when I talk about sports analytics applications and talk about those interconnections, uh, it gets uh, students really excited. And not just about sports, I want to get them excited about other applications so they can solve problems in this complex, interconnected world that we live in. Uh, and sports analytics can be a hook for them, and it's fun for me because I like following sports and participating in sports. All right, so that brings me to bracketology. How did I get involved with this? Well. You know, I was a graduate student studying Homeland Security, and I was very interested in sports analytics at that time, but I was really focused on my research, and I thought it would be great if I could come up with a model that would mathematically prove that the 85 Bears are the best team of all time. And, <laughs> but I was too busy doing other things at, the, at that time. Became a professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, and then came back to the Midwest at Wisconsin five years ago. Um, I was there less than a year, and somebody said to me, hey, there's going to be a college football playoff. You should do something. That could be exciting. And I thought that was a great idea. At the time, I was teaching a course in probability models where we covered things like Markov chains, and I taught the undergraduate course in simulation. And I thought, well, you know, if I, I do this, I want to get my students involved. I want to be able to talk about it with them in the classroom. It has much more value to me if we can use the methods that we're using in class, and I can show that they have application. Um, I really like looking ahead. I think engineers are very forward-looking. We're always looking into the future, and we're very optimistic. We believe that we can design things that will be an improvement. And so I really wanted to look at that path to the college football playoff. There's only four teams that make it in. Uh, it's a little bit different. It's a lot different than uh, the March Madness tournament for basketball. But I wanted to look at, if I could see ahead of time, who might, who might get in to the playoff. All right, so this is step one. I'll talk a little bit about basketball along the way because I do rank basketball teams. Um, that's about all I do with basketball teams. I don't do anything special for March Madness, so that, that could be a coming attraction. And I really use Markov chains for ranking sports teams. I'll get into what a Markov chain is in a minute, but they are a type of mathematical model that studies how a system evolves over time. And they're typically used for things like uh, modeling the stock market or financial applications, and also epidemiology and the spread of disease. They're the basis of queuing theory, so the science of waiting in line. Industrial engineers hate waiting, so we know all about queuing. And you can even use them to model a, you know, a zombie apocalypse. 
Uh, they're pretty useful models, and they're also useful for ranking, although it's way less obvious for how they're used for ranking sports teams. Um, but when I'm in, why I'm interested in ranking, there are some uh, engineering applications that I think share some goals with ranking sports teams, and I always try to bring it back into the bigger picture. Um, and the, especially with college football, we need to rank sports teams using not a lot of data. The season is pretty short, and we have to draw conclusions from limited data. And guess what? A lot of applications, we still have to do that, despite living in the, the big data world we live in. And we also need to make decisions, data-driven decisions, in the presence of uncertainty. Right, so usually in engineering, we focus a lot on the decision. And the statistics and the analysis help us make better decisions, but the statistics are not the end goal. So in Markov chains, we have a system. So I had said we had a collection of football teams in this case, and this is a graph of the college football teams. And two teams are connected if they play one another. Right? So we can move from team to team. Each team is a state. We just move from team to team. So we only can move from team to team if they play each other. And you can see the conferences in here, kind of color-coded. And you can see a lot of connectivity. So there's a lot of structure here. And then you can see the interconnect, uh, interconnections here. If you're looking for Wisconsin, there's Wisconsin in here. I do, don't, I should say that um, don't tell anybody that I'm not wearing badger red today. So people, that's frowned upon sometimes. Um, oh, there's Wisconsin. And the idea with Markov chains, we move from team to team. All right, so that's great. How do we get to ranking sports teams? Well, what we want to do is sort of vote, and I'll talk about how we do partial votes in a minute. We want to vote for the team that wins. So if I'm a losing team, I'll vote for one of the teams that beats me. And so if I move from team to team, and I keep moving around for over an infinite time horizon, I'll tend to more frequently move to teams that win games. Okay? And the teams that beat good teams, we visit the most. And so those are the, very, the most likely teams we'll visit. And at the end of the day, I just look at what fraction of time do I spend in each one of the, visiting each one of these teams. And that gives me a score, and I, then I just sort the scores, and I get a, a, a ranking. Uh, and this works pretty well. Uh, the downside is they have to play some games first. So I start at ground zero on day one, and I don't have any, any outcomes yet. But after a few weeks of, of games, I can start uh, rating and ranking the teams. OK, so this is a pretty interesting idea. I'm often asked, well, how do you account for strength of schedule? Well, I don't have to account for strength of schedule. The Markov chain does that. Uh, in the way that I just described in a more mathematical way. So that's pretty helpful with that. I also don't need a human in the loop. So eventually I will talk about forecasting the rest of the, the season. I don't want to have to make a judgment in each one of those thousands of simulations. I just want to know who's going to be one of the top four teams at the end of the season, uh, which is also, also pretty handy. And I'll get into some of the advantages of that in a moment. I use things that are very simple. I just use uh, the box score type things which is game outcomes, I look at the score and the score differential and where the game was played. So it's either a home game for somebody or it's on a neutral site. Um, this is handy for a couple reasons. One, I've got a day job that keeps me incredibly busy and three beautiful young girls on the side. Um, but also, it, it works pretty well and it's also really helpful when I talk to students because most of my students think football is a different sport and uh, they don't really understand what this is all about, but we can talk about wins and losses. Everybody sort of gets that, and they think it's pretty neat, actually, even uh, if they don't really know how to play football. And I look at the rankings, which kind of tells us who's, I think, is the best right now, and I differentiate that with the forecasts, and that looks at simulating the rest of the season and, set, and indicating who might make it into the playoff. Uh, the path to the playoff is very different for different teams. And usually, you know, I'm a, uh, I work at Wisconsin, and our path is usually pretty easy every year. The Big Ten West is quite a bit easier than, than the Big Ten East, but we'll see that other conferences have a pretty cushy path uh, to the playoff. Okay, so if you're wondering if this sounds familiar, this idea of a Markov chain for ranking, it's because it's Google's PageRank. Their first algorithm was based on these, um, this idea of moving from uh, state to state. They didn't have teams, they had uh, websites, and you wanted to find out where all the information was about a topic that you might be Googling on the internet, and you can't really read all the uh, information that's out there, but you can look at the websites and see where their outgoing links are. 
you can like randomly move to one of those teams that are linked to on, on, a, on a website. And so without reading everything that's on the internet, I can figure out where the information is on a topic by which sites have the most incoming links from the most widely read sites. Uh, and this is how they did it. And they've since changed their algorithm and, and done some other things uh, since, but it really helped. It really improved the search on the, uh, on the internet. And I'm old enough to remember things before Google, and they were terrible, all right? So we saw that this really made a difference, and this is one of these ideas that actually, uh, you know, Markov chain has really transformed our lives. So shout out to Markov chains today. All right, so back to ranking sports teams. The basic idea I use is the same for ranking football and basketball. The it's just the data that's different. And I borrow an, an idea that's out there, and I had to make some modifications to make it work for football in the very short seasons. Um, but here's just a, a simple idea. So I took, this is a game that was played in 2012, Wisconsin versus bitter rival Minnesota. And Wisconsin's won I, like 16 in a row of these now. Um, but Wisconsin won with this one by 25. It was at Wisconsin. And I wanted to look at this partial vote. So I'm, I'm not gonna give my whole vote from Minnesota to Wisconsin, but I'm gonna give a partial vote. So how much credit really should they get for the win? And if I figure that out, I can populate these probabilities on, on the Markov chain, right? And I do it game by game, and then I add all, all the games together at the end. Okay, so I wanna do this in a data-driven way. And so I wanna answer the following question. Given that team I beat team J by X points at home, what's the probability that team I is really better, right? So this, is, this game is like one sample. And of course this has to be on a neutral site because home field advantage is pretty big in college football and college basketball. Uh, the teams sometimes play twice if there's a, a playoff game. Uh, in basketball, they do often play twice in the same season. In football, they play the next season. So I said, well, that's close enough. I'll use that and I'll see how it works and I'll actually show you a graph and hopefully you'll, you'll think that's pretty reasonable. Um, but I, when they play each other, it's not on a, a neutral site the next game. Right? A home game becomes that team's away game. And so I can answer the second question, given that team I beat team J by X points at home, what's the probability that uh, team I is a better team than J when, when J is the home team? And I can just look at whether or not they, they won that next game. And I get this value that's down here and I'll plot it out in a minute and then I have to adjust for this, now this away game, and adjust it for a neutral site. Okay, so this seemed to jump together. Aha, so this is where I should be right now. Um, so this is uh, the score that we're looking at. This is the Wisconsin winning by 25 at home. So I'm gonna use my pointer here. So this is the score differential, differential in the first game, and then you look at the second game over here. So um, it's always relative to Wisconsin in this game, which was home game, the home team first, and then they were the away team. And you can see this slice is all the games where the home team won by 25 in the first, in the first uh, game. And you can see that there's some correlation, there's, there's, there's some positive correlation, and if you look really carefully, you can see the impact of the zeros. You can see that a lot of these scores are really below zero because of the home field advantage effect. Okay. So this is football. There's a lot more games played in college basketball, so this is what we see there. This is all games played within a single season. And um, I won't show the game here today, but I, the game I chose was a home team winning by 20. So I still have that here. If you look at this slice here, you can see that about, even if a team wins by 20 at home, they only have like a 60% chance of winning the next game that's away. And, <clears throat> and that's pretty surprising. But that's our data-driven answer to this question. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we can use logistic regression. And this is the, the picture. It looks prettier with the basketball scores because there's more games. And it fits pretty well. And you can see this team here that won by 20 at home would have about a 60% chance of winning next time on the road. And theoretically, if they tied at home in the first game, there'd only be a 40% chance of winning next time. Home field advantage is uh, pretty huge in college sports. One of the things you may notice here is, uh, let's say I want to get a lot of credit for a win. I have to win by a lot, like by 50 or 60. And, you know, if I win or lose a close game, 
like right in here, close to zero, I get like the same amount of credit for a win. If I won by a point or lost by a point. And I think that's a little crazy if I just use this curve to score and give this, these, uh, these partial votes. And I think you should get credit for winning the game. Uh, maybe a significant amount of credit. And so that's where I kind of blend this idea with a very simple binary model where we could assign full votes. Okay. And so here's the idea for men's football. If we use our data-driven answer, we get a curve like this. I actually take a log of the point differentials to account for running up the score. If you just throw the scores in there, you can see that there is a huge incentive to run up the scores, uh, as I just pointed out in that last slide. And um, that really does not give a lot of credit for winning unless you run up the score. And Wisconsin used to be kind of famous for that back in the day, sadly. Um, so I average that logistic regression curve in with something like this. And this works really well in football over a short season. And I get something that apparently was misplaced in my slide, uh, which is way back here. Oops, which is this. And so we end up with this uh, red curve right here. So if you win by a couple points or lose by a couple points, you can get a quite a different amount of credit for the game. Right? And this helps the model actually rank most effectively. All right, so I'm going to have to jump ahead a little bit. OK, so how does this all work? Well, I would say from this game that we had, the Minnesota-Wisconsin game, where Wisconsin won by 25 at home, the probability that Wisconsin would win in the next game on a neutral site would be about, you know, 0.6776, so maybe two chances out of three. Um, but I will give them a little bit more effective wins, about three quarters of the win uh, for, for that game. And if you're curious, Wisconsin did visit, or did win again in the next game, and they got the, uh, the was it the Paul Bunyan trophy? The, the axe, axe week, how did I forget that? Um, and it used to be called the slab of bacon trophy back in the day, Your fun fact of the day. Um, <laughs> I love Wisconsin, but sometimes I feel like it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous that all this stuff is, is true. <laughs> all right, so there's a picture of the ax right there. Um, and then you just do the same thing with the rest of the, the teams, and it works pretty well. And here's all the mascots jumping for joy because they're so excited about Markov chains. And, uh, and it works pretty well. So mo I, we'll talk a little bit about the results. So this is the results last year over time. So this is just the ranking part so far. And you can see that Alabama was up there and then, uh, you know, lost. Wisconsin was ranked number one for that one week. It was pretty sweet. But you can see Wisconsin was pretty high over time. After about seven weeks of games, the rankings are a little bit eh, not perfect. Uh, one thing I will say about Markov chains is they give a big boost to these mid-major teams like uh, Central Florida and you know, any math model that gives me things I'm not really sure what to do about, but they had an undefeated season and I think they should be ranked pretty high. Um, ultimately, I'm looking at teams that are ranked in the top four. So at the end of the season when all the games are, are played, the rankings are the forecast. There are no games left, right, except for the playoff. But you can see, uh, I don't know, I have, I'll come back to, to looking at this a little bit later on. All right. So I do the same thing actually with men's basketball, it's just different data, same idea. And I get something that looks like this, and I use this, this red curve to actually do the rankings for men's basketball. Okay, so over the years, I've developed some other rankings, I use other people's rankings, I've just described one ranking method. And I have all these other ranking models, they give me similar results, but some of them are different, some of them are quite different. And so I have a few of them, and I wasn't really sure what to do with them. So some of them are Markov chain based. Some, I sometimes deviate from the way and use other types of models that are sometimes linear models, like a Markov chain, sometimes not. But I have a few of them. And the question is, what do I do with them? I'd like to you know, combine this knowledge in some way. Well, I stole another idea from Google. And you can wrap a Markov chain around your Markov chain based rankings. And they can sort of like vote for the teams that are ranked higher than them. So it's that idea is you like sort of randomly choose a ranking. It's going to be a weighted random choice. And then randomly choose another team and you move to that team if it's ranked higher, otherwise you stay put in your own team. This is not an ergodic Markov chain, so it behaves a little bit differently, but you can actually help resolve the fact that different rankings sort of rank teams differently. And 
you can actually quantify with those differences and if it's meaningful. You can do this pretty quickly. So I've got a bunch of bad, I just love badger pictures. <laughs> They're pretty cute. Uh, all right, and I will show you my rankings. These were on Selection Sunday. These are the composite rankings using the, the markup chain or on the, mark, the, uh, the markup chain. And it's really interesting. I did have Villanova ranked number one and I had Virginia ranked number two. And we got to the Sweet 16. I actually have a blog post about where all the teams were in the rankings. And some of them were uh, ranked a little bit higher than I thought. They would be. Wisconsin's down there, sadly, at 68 in the composite rankings. I think Loyola of Chicago was like just off of this. So they were ranked quite high, and let's see, Kansas State, it's not so bad. Um, but why Virginia lost, I don't know. <laughs> Who did, they lost to UMBC, and they were not like right off this. They were like ranked 100th or something. It was, it was just something that I can't explain. Sometimes math doesn't have all the answers, and I'm okay with that. Um, but that was, quite a, that was quite a shocking situation. All right, and uh, the year before, Wisconsin was on this too. I don't always predict the winner ahead of time, but it is pretty interesting that the, the team, some of the teams that go pretty far into the tournament are ranked pretty high, and some of the teams that are, make some surprising upsets are up here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the football results later on. Now, next, I actually wanna talk about the forecasting step. All right, so the rankings take me up through the past, up to the present, and I'm particularly interested in the future and who has a chance to get into the playoff. And as you go further towards the end of the season, fewer and fewer teams like mathematically have a chance. And this is really what I like to study in the model. Okay. Um, and so what I really wanted to do is use these ranking methods. And the ranking methods are great because they rank the team. So if I were to simulate the rest of the season and just re-rank, then I just can pick the top four. Right. So my big assumption is that the committee is going to pick the top four and the top four best teams, um, which I know that they don't do in college basketball. But I think with college football and only having those four slots that are a very scarce resource, I think that's a pretty reasonable assumption. Um, so the next challenge was to somehow use the ratings that I use for my rankings to inform a simulation so I could simulate the rest of the season. Then I look at who would be in the conference championship games, uh, simulate that game, and see what shakes out at the end. Okay, so again, this is just the data that I use to get the ratings and the rankings. Uh, I haven't actually showed you what the numerical ratings look like, um, but they are in there, and they're pretty useful. And I looked at various different ways I could use those ratings, that numerical score, to inform uh, like who would win the next game and how well that works. And it's not an exact science, but uh, I tested out a few, a few ideas. And I'll discuss those in a moment. But first, I'm going to step you through the algorithms. Uh, I can't really rate the teams very well before week seven. And so most teams have played six games or sometimes five at this point. It's not a lot of games. I get that rating. I rank the teams. Okay, I've discussed that step. Then I do a game simulation. I simulate who wins or loses the next game. I assign some points to that game. I re-rate and re-rank the teams, and then I go through the next week of games. I go through the season week by week in that way. I get to the end of the season. I have to look at the conference championship games, and then I report who's in the top four. Right? So sometimes teams are very likely to make it into the playoff, but they're always like in that fourth slot, and I basically say they're in or they're out. That's the, the big equalizer at this point. <clears throat> I tested various methods for coming up with a win probability model for simulating the, the season, and the absolute difference in the ratings seemed to work the best. I used another logistic regression model here, and I actually did some training and a test set, and you can see it's not perfect, but this actually worked pretty well. The most important thing is to get the ratings right, because you can have a really bad rating system, and do really well at predicting the next game. And this is a lot better than random. Um, and if the rating doesn't work, and you have a, but you're really good at predicting the next week, the whole system together just doesn't perform well. So you need to do pretty well in both. And I'll show you some results showing that it seems to work pretty well. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the last three years of football. 2016 was really boring, I will say, so I'll, but I'll talk about that one briefly. 
Last year was kind of the worst if you're a Wisconsin fan. So this is where I had them on like Selection Sunday. I had Wisconsin in there as fourth, and I was very sad about that. It's just one loss to a really good team means that they were probably ranked in the top four. But I do understand why the committee couldn't pick them because that, the one game that they lost counted for a lot. But I do have the college uh, football committee's rankings over here. Um, I will say that I had Alabama ranked number seven, and if you notice in the chart I showed you earlier, I, they were ranked higher than that. Just that one week, they were at seven. There was like this little cluster of teams in there, and this is just the actual rating. They were ranked number one after winning their two games in the playoffs. Uh, this is the rating chart again. I want to step through this in time, because now you can look at Alabama and some of the teams. So the teams in the tournament I have in boldface, so you can find them a little bit easier. Uh, in years past, I've, you know, all four of them were ranked in the top nine all season. So this is kind of a, not always a very typical situation. You can see Alabama here, when they lost the game, they went from first to third. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then they didn't play in the, uh, a conference championship game. And so somehow, other team, lower ranked teams are able to be ranked a little bit higher than them. That one extra data point in a short college football season really seems to help, right? We're trying to make decisions with very limited data. The more data you have, you can make better decisions and have better rankings. Uh, Notre Dame, I'm an Illinois alum, and they, rank, they were ranked, it was, it was ugly. There's 118 teams, and they were ranked oh, over 100. That was really sad. But Notre Dame's a team of my youth, so that's why they're my, they're my backup team. And then Wisconsin's in the mix. Um, so I just try to follow those teams. The conference championships games really matter a lot. That's one thing that I will definitely say matters in the, in the rankings, but also in the for, especially in the forecast. Um, there's Ohio State. I just like to pick on Ohio State. No reason. <laughs> but too bad they didn't make it this year. All right. So how, the, how is this different from the forecast? And so I, this is actually the teams most likely to make it into the playoffs and based on the simulation. And then I just ranked them by their likelihood. And again, they're just in or out of the playoffs. And so being top ranked here is a little bit tricky um, in its interpretation. But one thing to notice is that you don't see Alabama way at the top so much, right? The SEC is really tough. And that's part of what we see here. You see Wisconsin right here, right? The, their remaining schedule is pretty cushy. They just had that one tough game in the, the Big Ten Conference uh, championship game at the end, right? That was their big obstacle to the playoff. Um, those are, I think, some of the most important things to notice. We'll pick on the uh, ACC later on, don't worry. Uh, but one thing you'll notice here is Alabama, when they lost, they went way down, right? And this is because they lost that birth to the SEC championship game, and that meant that they were, really had, all the stars had to align for them to make it into the playoff. That happened this year. All right, so 2016, I have like, I just totally remember every year of college football since the college football playoff. And just in case you don't, I have the, the teams over here. So this was Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, and Washington that year. And my rankings on Selection Sunday, I agreed with the, the committee. So I've always agreed with the committee except for last year. I would have left Alabama out and put UCF in if it was up to me. But it's not up to me. Uh, but it, it, this has been pretty amazing that actually with the math and a 12-game season that I can rank the teams as well as the committee, I would say. I, um, I, think that I, just, I think it's a really beautiful thing about math and data that we can do that. Uh, and I continue to be amazed by that. Um, so I had the order a little slightly off this year, and then Clemson and Washington were tied. If we look at the rankings over the course of the season, it's pretty interesting. So I have the committee up here and the first line for each team, and then I have my rankings where they ended up uh, in the second line. And this was Alabama was just kind of obvious. Uh, Clemson was way up there. I had them ranked a little bit lower sometimes. And um, you can see Ohio State was up here and from Washington. So we, we pretty much agree for most of the season. This is you know, kind of shocking that they, it works out so nicely. Um, I want to compare the forecasted ranking with, with uh, which is in bold. So this is actually looking at the remainder of the season. And early on, there's more like remaining season left than later on uh, with the actual ranking. 
As you can see for Alabama, they were just ranked number one the whole season. Clemson was uh, ranked third through fifth, but you could see that the forecast ranking was usually second. They were like the second most likely team to make it to the playoff. And this is because it's just the ACC, the remaining schedules that in, in the ACC. Um, so they were always very likely to make it in and that like, you know, for their ranking. Uh, and that's the most notable thing I should say at, at this point is that every year it always seems like the ACC has the easiest path into the playoff. And that's been a pretty robust finding since the first year in 2014. Um, we can go back a year to 2015. So in 2016, if you notice those teams, all four of those teams are ranked pretty high the entire season. It's been more exciting when like a team starts out, they're ranked it's like barely in the top 25 and they somehow get their way back in. And that's been pretty interesting to look back at the forecasts and, and see, well, did, mathematically, did we think those teams had a chance? And definitely in 2014 and 2015, we see that a little bit. So 2015, Clemson was ranked number one. I had them ranked number two. We also have Alabama, Michigan State, and Oklahoma. So this is another one we can pick on, Ohio State losing, which is always fun to do. Um, but we can look at the rankings and then the forecasts here. Okay, so I want to point out a couple things here from uh, basically the, the college football playoff committee rankings and in my rankings is that we can see that sometimes the math is more quickly, can more quickly recognize when a team is improving like Oklahoma. Uh, this is a year when I think Oklahoma, people doing the math found that Oklahoma was a really good team and sometimes it, it takes the college football playoff committee a little bit longer to recognize that uh, just due to humans doing the rankings. Um, let's see, so here we have the, the now rankings versus the forecasted rankings. And we have a couple of interesting things. I want to pick on Michigan State here because this is sort of an interesting uh, year. And if I, oh, I want to point out something first. I want to pick on the ACC first. We have to do that. So it was really interesting early on, Clemson was ranked seventh, but they were still the second most likely team to make it in the playoff. Why? Because they're in the ACC. Right, so the remaining schedule was a little bit easier for the, uh, the top teams from the other conferences. And this was true for Florida State the year before. Um, the Michigan State was really interesting. So they lost early on to Nebraska, and it affected their rankings, and it really affected their ability to make it to the playoff. Um, but then they rebounded a couple weeks later by beating The Ohio State University, and so they went uh, you can see, really see, in, especially in the, the forecast, that mathematically they went from eighth to fourth and they were, really became one of the more likely teams to make it to the playoffs uh, at that point. And that was pretty interesting to see that you know, one game can really change these things quite a bit. And in this case, it's really who gets it into the uh, Big Ten uh, championship game. And there's not a big, there was not, there's still not a Big 12 championship game, although that's changing. And so sometimes the forecasts say Oklahoma is the most likely team to make it into the playoff. That's because their season was done, and no matter what happens, they were going to be ranked in the top four. So they're really not ranked one down here. That's where uh, sometimes the interpretation here can get pretty, uh, a little bit tricky. All right, so. Uh, it's been a pretty pretty good run. We've, I've generally agreed with the uh, committee, and it's been fun to follow along. And it's, I don't have all the other teams listed on here, but during the season, you can see that maybe about a dozen teams could could theoretically make it to the playoff. And as the season goes on, you can see when really that's mathematically unlikely to happen. All right, so I want to wrap things up with a little bit about education. I'm a professor. Uh, I like to talk about sports analytics in the classroom. Uh, I try to tie it into my classes when, whenever possible. These, uh, ranking sports teams has been great. Uh, students don't have to understand sports. I used to talk about baseball analytics and oh, when, you should, when should you steal a base. And I have so many international students that was just, that was pretty tough. I have taught a course on sports analytics and that was really a lot of fun and rigorous for the students as well. And I used to teach a freshman class in engineering, and students would really be interested in sports analytics. Usually that was the first time they had heard about it, period, uh, for many of our students. So that was pretty neat to do. And I always like talking to the media whenever possible. 
and I've done a lot of podcasts, including the Great, Lake Pod, Great Lakes podcast. Uh, my other passion, though, is uh, just helping engineering become more inclusive and helping everybody be welcome at the table. And so I had, uh, there were some really great talks on en engineering and uh, or education and sports analytics today. Um, but I've given a lot of thought to, you know, how we can really use it to bring people in, get them hooked on math, statistics, sports, and, you know, create that a welcoming environment for them. So I first want to have, I have a hypothesis. My hypothesis is women are as interested or even more interested in sports than men. Does anybody think this hypothesis is true like I do? Oh, great, some of you. <laughs> So usually when I talk, the audiences look like this. Um, in engineering nationwide, um, we have about 25% of our undergraduates at UW-Madison are women. And I, when I talk about sports, 25% uh, of the audience is, is never women, right? It's much lower than that. And it's usually not as diverse uh, as just our student body is in many different ways. And so this is, I think we have some opportunities here. So I'm not only interested in sports an analytics, I'm an athlete. So I have a chart, and I have data, because I love data. And I, I like to do a lot of running. Actually, I, I ran a marathon this weekend. Um, but this is road races and event finishers. And women, this isn't showing up too well. Women, women run 57% of the races, or 57% of the finishers in races run in the United States. And they're, they run, outrun men at every single distance, uh, except for the marathon, but this data is from 2015, and I, they probably surpassed men by now. And this is just one example. Um, but women are definitely out there, and I've, I've seen other statistics looking at women's participation in sports, and I just want women's participation in, in sports analytics to be up there, cl closer to parity. Um, so I've been trying to make an effort to do this in the classroom. I'm terrified that I am creating a climate problem by talking about sports in the classroom and making people feel not welcome. I get a lot of good feedback, but I do, I do worry about this uh, from time to time. But there's some things that I've done to try to break down the barrier and try to make uh, the, the classroom a little bit more inclusive. So there's a lot of things I do to make the classroom inclusive, but there's some sports analytics ways that I do this uh, as well. And you know, one thing that I've done is I've tried to take, you know, I've taken baseball out of my examples. I'm sad when I've removed base, the baseball examples from my notes, but I really just lose a lot of students, international, uh, mostly international students, when they have to understand how a sport's played. So if I focus on wins and losses, this is great. They don't even have to like sports, but they can think it's kind of cool and appreciate the application. Uh, this has been a good thing. I also try to tie sports analytics to other applications. I mentioned Google, I mentioned recommender systems where you might need to recommend some, some products on a ranked list, and we talk about some of those other applications. Uh, so sometimes students aren't so interested in sports analytics, but they're able to, it makes it accessible and helps them understand how they can use the classroom topics to things that really do interest them more than sports. Um, I've really, really been a stickler about saying men's basketball when I do the, the basketball rankings because women play basketball too. Um, uh, and I'm pretty good at this. This was really hard at first. I still say you guys because I'm a native Midwesterner. And so I'm not perfect, <laughs> um, but I'm getting there. Um, third, when I did the sports analytics course, I made an effort to include women's sports. So I had, we had women's volleyball. I was talking about this at lunch. We did the Markov chain to look at the impact of uh, rally scoring on women's volleyball scores. Uh, women's hockey, Wisconsin has a great women's hockey team. Uh, we looked at women's World Cup soccer. Uh, we looked at curling. I mentioned running events. And I did try to incorporate para sports, but I didn't have any specific examples for my course on that. So that was kind of a, a fail for me. Uh, when I tore, uh, taught the sports analytics course, I really recognized and appreciated that the data are not inclusive. It is really hard to get good data for women's sports. You can get box score data for women's World Cup and women's basketball, uh, but I was really trying to be inclusive and really finding it very, very difficult uh, to do so. So what I did when I had the, uh, the project for the course was I gave extra credit if they did a, a sport that was like a women's sport or para sport just to reward them for the data collection effort. And I will say that nobody took me up on that. So maybe I need to offer more, 
more extra credit next time. So, I, but I still think it was a good idea. I just had a small sample size of that one course. Uh, so anyway, I want to uh, wrap things up with what I've learned about sports analytics. I, you know, I think that it is a way to get a lot of people interested and excited about analytics and everything we can do with it. I've also had the pleasure of talking about sports analytics in the news. You can watch a, a cheesy video of me talking about rankings that the University of Wisconsin made. And it's, it's really fun. And quite often, I'm told when I do the media interviews, wow, you're the only woman that we've ever had to talk about sports. And it's a little bit, uh, I, I, it's awesome, but I think we've got some, some uh, room for growth in that area. So with that, I'd be happy to uh, end my talk and answer any questions that you have. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I should. Look, I have have a lot of thoughts on that. I haven't actually used that information yet. I've tried to keep it simple and manageable with my day job. But yeah, there are definitely ways to do that. That's a good suggestion. No, there's one more. So um, I have a lot of my excellent talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, but so I have a lot of my students that are bringing profit uh, going through the industrial operation. Yay. Um, thank you. One of the things that since I'm a bottom of Canvas guy, I have a lot mm -hmm. of difficulty figuring out what to do with them. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want me to send you some information afterward about yeah. the topics I covered in my course? And I can tell you about some, what some of the projects were okay. uh, that we did as well. Um, kind of like a, it's not always the most exciting topic, but like sports scheduling is like <laughs> one of our bread and butter topics because scheduling in general is um, kind of a big industrial engineering topic. But there's other things you could do, and I have a lot of ideas. Oh yeah, there probably would be. I, we did a lot of hockey analytics in the, the course and like soccer analytics of like scoring goals and over time and I would be interested in checking that out. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a question back there and then up here. Uh, so. Yes, the, uh, the issue of like data gathering for women's sports has been um, floating around for like a couple of years as far as I've noticed in my circles. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I was wondering, I, I know there's a Pac-38 article about it, and, and uh, I, I don't know what are sort of the approaches to resolving this problem besides just generally increasing interest uh, for a general audience in this Do you have any sort of understanding of the best ways to approach that? That's a good question. It would be great to have a repository of some more data available. Um, and yeah, I, so the question is, yeah, just getting people to share more of their data sets on that. I really like that 538 article. Um, but there's, there's just so much data that's out there. And it seems like it's increasing for mostly men's sports that it's very hard to catch up in any sort of meaningful way if you just do your little research piece on the side. 
I was really excited about the volleyball analytics talk and the equestrian talk today uh, about the, some of the data coll collection efforts that, that are being made right now. Um, so with women's volleyball, there's a potential, potentially a huge opportunity for that. Um, but there doesn't seem to be that, as much real-time tracking for women's basketball so as, as there is for men's basketball. And I hope that changes somewhat as the technologies to do so become more ubiquitous. Yeah, so like you're saying using the information at the end like, to re-rank it? Ah, okay. Yeah, I did some early work with, I was using some of the past seasons to, I wasn't simulating the, the whole season in that same way, but it was pretty similar. I was trying to kind of simulate what I was doing and then having um, like a validation set at the end and but without knowing what happened at the end of the season and it seemed to work pretty well and there were definitely a bunch of different methods that I tested and sometimes when I did the simulations going forward you'd see some zeros in there like there's no chance this team would have to make the playoff and those that was like the most the easiest way to identify the bad methods uh, because sometimes teams have a chance but you know it's a long shot early on and they do get in there and you try, it's uh, very hard to know, like quantify, like what getting it right really means when there's a few weeks to go. So there was a few ways I looked at that, but I did um, something pretty similar to um, do that with a few seasons worth of data before I went live. Thank you. Great, great talk to end the conference. Uh, and this concludes the second annual Great Lakes Analytics and Sports Conference. Thanks again for coming. Uh, look in your email in the coming weeks for a uh, post-conference survey. We'd appreciate some feedback. We'll make it short and sweet. Uh, maybe a prize, probably not. Um, yeah, but uh, <laughs> budgets, you know. Um, but um, yeah, but we'd like your feedback. Uh, obviously, we can always improve, uh, but we were encouraged enough by the participation and, and quality of the ideas being shared at, at this event that we would like to keep it going forward. Um, so with that, with that, look for the, the date for next year's. We'd probably like to do it in the summertime again, but there again, let us know when it works best for you. Um, keep in touch, drive home safely, fly home safely, travel by train home safely. Uh, have a good weekend. Bye now.